Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks, what's the difference between anorexia nervosa, specifically the binge eating purging type, and bulimia nervosa? I also received a number of other questions in the same area of eating disorders, like what about atypical anorexia nervosa and binge eating disorder? How do they fit into how we classify these different behaviors we see with eating disorders? And how would all these disorders be ranked in terms of seriousness? So a variety of questions here that I'm going to attempt to answer in this video. So I think a number of these questions were probably prompted by the Shane Dawson video about Eugenia. So Eugenia is a YouTube content creator. She was a content creator for quite a while and she started losing weight. She took a break from YouTube, went to get treatment for an eating disorder, and then upon her return we see this video at Shane Dawson where he basically just interviews her and sees how she is doing and kind of what her plans are and all that. We also see another video by Jacqueline Glenn kind of responding to this and raising concerns that the eating disorder that Eugenia has may not be getting treated well enough, right? The treatment may not be suitable. But either way, we see, again, a lot of videos and a lot of interest in this topic. Interest in how eating disorders get diagnosed, what are the symptoms that we would see with certain disorders, and again, like I talked about before, how do we separate them? How do we know when one set of symptoms is different than another set of symptoms? How can we tell these disorders apart? So to start with, the way eating disorders are classified in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual is highly confusing. There's really no two ways about this. It's not easy to understand these eating disorders, even though there's really just a few of them. There's just so much overlap, and they're so similar in nature. And not only is this confusing to the public, it's often confusing to clinicians. We see a lot of misdiagnosing when we talk about eating disorders. So this is confusing, but we can differentiate the disorders because there are a number of subtle differences between them, and sometimes there are some more obvious differences. So when we talk about eating disorders, we're really talking about the section of the DSM called feeding and eating disorders. And some of the ones we hear about kind of often would be avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, anorexia nervosa, which I'll talk about, bulimia nervosa, I'll also talk about that, and binge eating disorder. But then we have this other category called Other Specified Feeding or Eating Disorder. And this is where things get even more confusing. We see a few more disorders in here, including disorders like atypical anorexia nervosa. And we also see another type of bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder. It's a low frequency, limited duration type, right? It's not a type in the sense of it belongs under the main classification. And I'll explain what types are in a moment. It's actually a separate disorder. So bulimia nervosa and bulimia nervosa, low frequency, limited duration, are technically separate disorders. Now we also see another disorder in the same category, purging disorder. So how can we untangle this mess of similar disorder classifications? I'm going to start here with anorexia nervosa. So looking at anorexia, we see a number of symptoms restriction of energy intake relative to requirements, so not eating as much, and this restriction leads to significantly low body weight. This is really an important criterion when talking about differentiating this disorder from other eating disorders. We also see an intense fear of gaining weight or becoming fat. We see a disturbance in the way in which one's body weight or shape is experienced. We see undue influence of body weight and shape in terms of self-evaluation or we see a persistent lack of recognition of the seriousness of the current low body weight. So anorexia nervosa also has two subtypes. And this becomes a little confusing because a lot of times we just use the word types. So subtypes and types really shouldn't be interchangeable, but again, that's how we often use them. And we see that there's a restricting type. So during the last six months, no recurrent episodes of binge eating or purging behavior are observed. That's the restricting type. So when I talk about purging behavior, and I'll talk about it many times in this video, I'm talking about different behaviors like misuse of laxatives, diuretics or enemas, and self-induced vomiting. So when we're talking about the restricting type, the weight loss is accomplished through 
other means, like dieting, fasting, or excessive exercise, but not purging behaviors. Now, the next type is the binge eating purging type, and this is the one that gets confused a lot with bulimia nervosa. During the last six months, we do see recurrent episodes of binge eating and purging behavior, right? So when we talk about these two types, and whenever we talk about types in the DSM, we know that types are mutually exclusive, so somebody can only have one type or the other, and of course some disorders have more than two types, and they're also jointly exhaustive. That means if you take all the types together, you explain every possible manifestation or expression of that disorder. So there's nothing outside of the types. So if somebody has anorexia, they have one of the types. You have to have one of the types to have the disorder. So these types, as I mentioned, technically they're referred to as subtypes. Again, are mutually exclusive and jointly exhaustive. But somebody can move from one subtype to the other throughout the course of the disorder. And actually, this is fairly common for anorexia. We actually expect this could happen many times during the course of the illness. With other disorders, we see that a lot of times people kind of stay in one type. They don't move from subtype to subtype. Again, anorexia is not that way. So if a clinician is working with somebody with anorexia nervosa and they believe that they are moving from one subtype to another, that really shouldn't be surprising. Now, the severity of this disorder is determined by BMI. So there's a specific way to determine the level of severity. Now, severity is, of course, a specifier and not a subtype. And we see the specifiers available for severity here go from mild all the way through extreme. So now let's take a look at bulimia nervosa. So we see several criteria for this disorder, including recurrent episodes of binge eating. And these episodes are characterized by both of the following. Eating in a discrete period of time, for example, a two-hour period, an amount that is definitively larger than what most individuals would eat in a similar period of time under similar circumstances. The second component here to binge eating, a sense of having a lack of control over the eating episode, which of course is different than an actual lack of control. So that is an important distinction to make. Next we see that inappropriate compensatory behaviors are used to prevent weight gain. So this is where it kind of gets tricky. Some of these overlap with purging, like misuse of laxatives and vomiting. I talked about that before. But some also overlap with the other ways to prevent gain I mentioned before, like excessive exercise and fasting. So both of these behaviors, the binge eating and the compensatory behaviors, occur at least once a week for three months. The self-evaluation is unduly influenced by body shape and weight, right? This is similar to what we see with anorexia. And we also see that the disturbance does not occur exclusively during episodes of anorexia nervosa. So sometimes what happens is a person no longer meets the full criteria for anorexia, but they still have the binge eating purging cycle. So their diagnosis would change from anorexia to bulimia after they've met the full criteria for bulimia nervosa for three months. The severity of bulimia nervosa is dictated by the number of compensatory behaviors in a week. So with anorexia, it was the BMI that determined severity. With bulimia, it's the number of compensatory behaviors. Mild is 1 to 3 in a week, all the way to extreme, which is 14 or more in a week. So what's the difference between these two disorders? Well, other than having like a different course and a different treatment, like there can be different treatment protocols, Kind of the obvious difference would be that with anorexia, we see low body weight. Somebody's underweight. With bulimia, by definition, somebody has a normal weight or they're above normal weight. So that's really the important differentiating factor that kind of stands out. Again, it's a little bit more obvious than some of the other differences between these disorders. When somebody with anorexia also has binging and purging behavior, the anorexia diagnosis supersedes bulimia. And here's where things really get confusing. We see this diagnosis I talked about before of atypical anorexia nervosa. All the criteria of anorexia are met except that despite significant weight loss, the person still has a normal weight or they're above normal weight. I hear this misrepresented frequently in a number of online sources 
people report that atypical anorexia is when somebody has anorexia without the weight loss. That simply is not true. Again, despite the weight loss, they have a normal weight or above. So they still have significant weight loss with atypical anorexia nervosa, but that weight loss didn't push them down to a low body weight. So that's important, I think, for a few reasons, but again, one is because it's so frequently misunderstood. Now, what we see here is that many people with atypical anorexia end up being misdiagnosed with bulimia nervosa, especially if the type of anorexia they had was the binging and purging subtype. That's really the subtype that gets confused in a clear way with bulimia nervosa. So what about binge eating disorder, right? This just adds, again, more confusion to all this. Well, essentially, it is like bulimia, but without the compensatory behaviors. So really, binge eating isn't as hard to differentiate from the other disorders as the other disorders are to differentiate from one another in most cases, right? We see, again, no compensatory behaviors, but we do see the binge eating behavior. Not surprisingly, if you look at what's happening here, it is associated with obesity or being overweight. Also, binge eating disorder typically responds much better to treatment than does bulimia nervosa. So what about purging disorder? Well, this disorder, somebody uses purging behaviors without binge eating. So we don't see any binge eating, but the purging behaviors are still there. So with these disorders, how would all these disorders be ranked in terms of seriousness? Well, of course, to be clear, all of them are serious. But usually the way we think of ranking in terms of seriousness of these disorders, starting with the most serious, would be anorexia nervosa, then atypical anorexia, then moving to bulimia nervosa, purging disorder, and then the least serious binge eating disorder. Now, not everybody agrees on this ranking system, of course. Many researchers believe that purging disorder should be moved up in terms of seriousness. But then again, we see other researchers that don't believe purging disorder is actually a disorder at all, meaning those symptoms don't actually cluster together to make a legitimate classification. So we see a lot of controversy here with eating disorders, not just around purging disorder, but really a lot of controversy around all of the disorders in this section. So again, we have to be careful about how much weight we give to any ranking system. All of the disorders are serious. So I know whenever I talk about eating disorders and how to tell them apart in these different kinds of topics, there'll be a variety of opinions, people who agree with me, disagree with me, and have other thoughts and examples from their own experiences. Please put those opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate a really interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found this description of the eating disorders to be interesting. Thanks for watching.